Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Hey, really glad you're with us for the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Two good martinis for you today, plus a crazy, and it's one we've kind of been down uh, that path before, but we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Let's go to good martini number one. It looks like HR1 is going to die, and that is a very good thing. That is the sweeping election reform, as the Democrats would call it, bill, uh, that would uh, pretty much do away with voter ID uh, and basically have Washington dictate how the 50 states run elections. And so with Manchin saying he won't support it, you would think that no Republicans would uh, get in the way of that bill dying. Uh, So that's the good news, Jim. Uh, Anytime Manchin is breaking our way, we'll take it. The bad news is that Manchin is telling ABC News that he still wants a one-size-fits-all federal approach to this issue, and clearly uh, this is an issue, how to run elections, that should be left up to the states. He says, I believe Democrats and Republicans feel very strongly about protecting the ballot boxes, allowing people to protect the right to vote, making it accessible, making it fair, and making it secure in the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. If we apply that to all 50 states and territories, it's something that can be done and should be done. I think uh, we as Federalists would strongly disagree with that one-size-fits-all approach. But at least for the moment, H.R. 1 appears to be very much dead, and that's good. Yeah, and not only that, let's observe, Greg, that uh, any bill that genuinely was bipartisan, you know, folks on the right would have much less less reason to be objecting to. Uh, I actually kind of wonder if the standards that Manchin is setting out here saying that it has to have serious support from both Democrats and Republicans. You assume that would mean that he would, if you had, you know, 50 Republic, 50 Democrats on board and Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski, that Manchin probably would not be jumping on board, but he's disappointed us in the past, so we don't want to uh, count our chickens before they hatch. But I'm just going to observe. I kind of think that if you're the Democrats, and let's say you 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 know say okay fine we're going to do the John Lewis Voting Rights Act it's kind of watered down it's not really what we wanted but we pass it and it passes you know let's say seventy five to twenty five or something like that what does that do well you can't really claim that Republicans are going to steal the elections anymore you can't really claim that Republicans are cheating in Georgia and in Florida and in Texas and all that kind of stuff it takes away the issue that Democrats really like using to jazz up their base and get people really fired up and excited. And, you know, heading into a midterm election, the president's party usually faces a fairly serious problem in terms of getting people motivated and fired up. So I think in a strange way that we've had this recurring pattern in politics where parties would rather have the issue than actually have a legislative solution because then they can, they can campaign on it. And they say, that's why you got to keep us in office. That's why we need more members of our party in office. Because once you resolve that issue, once you pass a major bill and say, Hey, we've solved that problem. Well, the voters don't need you anymore. Remember Winston Churchill lost not too long after World War II. And I think there are a lot of Republicans who would argue that uh, once the issues of welfare reform and crime were solved in the mid to late 90s, all of a sudden they didn't need uh, Republicans in office the same way they did. So in a certain way, there's a disincentive for solving a problem uh, that there is there. So I think deep down, there are plenty of Democrats who really wanted to to pass H.R. 1 who might be willing to go along with some sort of watered down compromise by not, but probably a lot of Democrats would be perfectly happy to vote no on what they would see as a watered down compromise because they don't want the watered down compromise. They want Democrats to be convinced that elections will be stolen unless they show up in overwhelming numbers. So I I keep deep down, I think Manchin's opposition here not only makes HR1 unlikely to happen, I think it's overall not terribly likely that any type of election law reform Uh, occurs and is signed into law by Joe Biden in this cycle. Yeah, and I think that's good. This is an issue that should be decided by the states. Some of them are moving in that direction. Others are certainly planning to. And I think Tim Scott did such a great job in his State of the Union response. He highlighted so many issues that Republicans know the public supports. He talked about school choice, for example. But on election reform, he talked about, uh, you know, voter ID, something that the overwhelming majority of everybody, uh, Republicans, even Democrats, I think, support uh, voter ID. Uh, Blacks and Hispanics certainly do. Uh, And the other issue that is constantly brought up here that the Democrats won't touch is cleaning up the rolls. They, for some reason, have this weird fixation of not taking off the names of dead people. 
from state voter rolls. What could possibly be wrong with that? <laughs> yeah, the more adamantly they oppose this, the more you start to say, okay, why are you so worried about this? You know? Yes. Well, uh, I just, look, they've, they've put a lot of effort into getting the zombie American vote out each year, and they're just worried <laughs> about, uh, you know, making sure those uh, those Americans are adequately represented. I believe the term, actually, I call them zombie Americans. It's not true, uh, Greg. They they really prefer the term apparition Americans. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, you know, that used to be a big constituency in Illinois back when that was a competitive state. Now that the Democrats are winning it with live people pretty handily, uh, it's not as critical. But in some other states, uh, the dead vote could make a very big difference. So. I guess I can see why they would uh, want to keep that constituency happy. All right, Jim, let's talk about our uh, first great sponsor today, and that is Bambi, because, look, human resources issues can be a major problem uh, at your business. Uh, Wrongful termination suits, minimum wage requirements, labor regulations, the government always sticking its nose in, you know. And uh, look, HR manager salaries aren't cheap. In fact, they cost an average of $70,000 every year. But Bambi, which is spelled B-A-M-B-E-E, not like the Disney deer, was created specifically for small businesses. You can get a dedicated HR manager, craft HR policy, and maintain your compliance all for just $99 a month. With Bambi, you can change HR from your biggest liability to your biggest strength. Your dedicated HR manager is available by phone or email or real-time chat. And from onboarding determinations, they customize your policies to fit your business and help you manage your employees day to day. And again, all of this for just $99 a month. And this is month to month, no hidden fees, and you can cancel anytime. Look, your business has enough issues that uh, require your time and attention right now. You didn't start your business because you wanted to spend all that time on HR compliance. So get the help at a really good price. Let Bambi help and get your free HR audit today. Go to Bambi.com slash martini right now to schedule your free, that's right, free HR audit. That's Bambi.com slash martini, spelled BAM to the B-E-E dot com slash martini. All right, Jim, let's move to our second good martini now. And this comes from the keyboard of your National Review Online colleague, Charlie Cook, who is uh, just absolutely taking down Rebecca Jones. And for those who don't know who Rebecca Jones is, she is the uh, hero of the left who claimed that the Florida government, and, you know, of course, that means Ron DeSantis, uh, was cooking the books when it came to COVID cases and COVID deaths. But Charlie explains how Rebecca Jones, first of all, is just probably an unstable and uh, unhealthy person, uh, basically was uh, called on the carpet for unrelated issues and was uh, talked about how she was going to have to go through uh, counseling and she wasn't going to be terminated, but she absolutely flipped out. She crashed the dashboard in Florida. And when she got called out on that, she started uh, this whole canard about how uh, the books were cooked and she was ordered to fudge the numbers. And Charlie explains in very clear detail how none of that's true. Uh, and how it's very clear that all along she was the only one who was making all of this up. The data is fine, uh, and she has become this cause celeb on the left, and everything about her and about this argument that we're already seeing from Charlie Crist and some of the other people running for office in 2022 is just a flat-out lie. My uh, my friend and colleague Charlie Cook, men- I knew he's been working on this story for a while, and he mentioned to me earlier this week that uh, because Rebecca Jones is quite litigious, Uh, National Review had uh, brought out the lawyers for this one, gone through every little detail, every word, every piece of punctuation in this article to make sure that it was airtight, watertight, and that there'd be no no basis even for a frivolous lawsuit here. And it has checked out and it is is thoroughly devastating. You may have heard a bit about this here and there. I think Charlie offers the most complete story you're going to find. And he also includes links to all the Florida Department of Health documents. This is not just quoting people anonymously. Um, one of the things I have, I'm, one good section that I think is probably, I'll just read it out loud and kind of whet our listeners' appetite for this. Um, With the enthusiastic help of the press, Rebecca Jones has unremittingly inflated the prominence of the position she held. And yet, when one reads through the, federal, the Florida Department of Health documents that chronicle the affair, one is struck by how dull and unheroic the whole thing really was. There are no whistleblowers anywhere in this story. There is no scandal. There is no grand fight for truth or justice. 
There is just a replacement level government employee who repeatedly breaks the rules, who is repeatedly mollycoddled. That's how you know this is a Charlie Cook piece. <laughs> mollycoddled while doing so, and who is fired only when she eventually renders herself unworthy of the department's considerable grace. And he lays it all out step by step, day by day. It is comprehensive. It is clear. And it really is a stinging indictment of all of the national media and Florida media people who trusted her when all this information, particularly about the past legal problems and how she's more or less gotten canned from every job she's ever had, pretty much, uh, uh, you know, this basically, this story has been out there the whole time. This is not somebody um, you need to put, uh, you should put a great deal of, of your faith in. He's not somebody you should treat as a reliable source. And yet many institutions did. Um, hopefully, I've been Stan Charlie's phone has been ringing off the hook. Television folks are talking about wanting to do segments on this. Hopefully, this will be a giant step towards dispelling one of the more egregious cases of misinformation during this pandemic. But um, let's just say you know, there is a Sisyphean element <laughs> to what we try to do sometimes. And I, my fear is that this will be, we will get this, this, bold, this particular bold and we'll get all the way up the mountain. But there are still a lot of other boulders that are still rolling further back down the mountain. No, absolutely right. This is not a case of just uh, incorrect interpretation of data or misinterpreting uh, a directive from a superior. This was a deliberate misrepresentation uh, and just a, a whole made out of whole cloth lie that Rebecca Jones is perpetrating here. But as we see so often now in our political culture, uh, the people who can spread it around the world, they don't care if it's true. They, it's, it, it helps their side, and therefore they'll push it to, all the way to the max. And uh, like we've said <laughs> many times before, uh, the lie gets around the world a couple different times before the truth can get its pants on. Or perhaps a uh, more sophisticated Jim, the Sisyphean boulder up the hill. <laughs> all right, well, let's talk about something a little more comfortable than that. And that is the great towels from my pillow. These things are so soft, and they're fluffy, and they're super absorbent. You're dry. In a, in a split second after the shower. But right now, you can also get them for a really, really low price. The MyPillow six-piece towel sets are regularly $109.99, but now you can get them for $44.98 when you use the promo code MARTINI at MyPillow.com. You know, Greg, when I spend a lot of my day pushing a boulder up a hill, and in many cases <laughs> watching it roll back down again, I sweat a lot and I need a towel. MyPillow towel sets are made from proprietary technology that are highly absorbent, they're soft without that lotion-y feel, and they're made from cotton grown right here in the United States. They're available in a variety of colors. They come with a 60-day money-back guarantee and a one-year limited warranty. Each set includes two bath sheets, two hand towels, and one two-pack washcloth. $65 off. You can't beat this price. Go to MyPillow.com and click on the radio listener square. Enter the promo code MARTINI at checkout or when you call 800-874-0104. While you're there, take advantage of the deep discounts on all MyPillow products, including the Giza Dream bed sheets, MyPillow premium pillows, and the new My Slippers. Get your MyPillow six-piece towel set for only $44.98, but only with our promo code MARTINI. Call 800-874-0104 or visit MyPillow.com today. All right, Jim, it's a day ending in Y, and that means people who used to call themselves conservatives and Republicans who hate Donald Trump are have their hands out for more money again. Uh, there's a new effort to create a new political movement, and some might say a new political party. It's entitled A Call for American Renewal, Building a Common Sense Coalition for America. And they have their preamble. They've got their principles. Uh, these are the same people that we've been rolling our eyes at for a long time, at least most of them. You've got your Evan McMullins in here. Uh, your Max Boots are in here. There's a lot of names here that they say are top Republicans, but uh, most of these people couldn't be picked out of a lineup. Charlie Dent, Mike Hayden, Mindy Finn. A lot of these people uh, have been uh, just having their hands out now for four to five years, and now they're they're out with this again. Of course, they're timing it due to the ouster of Liz Cheney, saying this is the last straw. We There's no hope for the Republican Party. We've got to do this now. And so, Jim, uh, something tells me they had this ready to go. They are just waiting for the right moment to hit the send button here. So whether it's the Lincoln Project, whether it's uh, whatever else you want to say that's been developed over the last few years, this looks to be like the uh, latest in a long line of grifters. You know, Greg, before I jump into this, I'm going to make two observations. One, somebody gave us some grief yesterday on Twitter because we didn't talk about Liz Cheney. Um, because as you know, Greg, if we don't talk about it on the Three Martini Lunch, it didn't happen. 
<laughs> and there's no, first of all, we'd never talked about this, Cheney, before, uh, ever. You know, we couldn't, you couldn't check back to previous podcasts that because they held the vote to remove Liz Cheney by voice vote, somehow we should have dedicated a portion of it. Look, yesterday's edition of the Three Martini Lunch was based entirely on the three releases of government statistics that made up the morning jolt. And when I say, hey, Greg, let's write it, let's talk about what I wrote about in the morning jolt, Greg often agrees with me. So if you want to give anybody grief about the topics of last night's show or yesterday's show, give it to me. I will take your complaint and ignore it. Um, but on to, we are talking about something in the context of, of Liz Cheney's uh, departure. We saw, actually it was two days ago, Tuesday in the uh, New York Times. It was a really you know, eye-popping uh, statement that hundred more than 100 Republicans, including former officials, threatened to split from the GOP, that they were going to form a third party. And I, I responded to this yesterday, kind of, saying, look, you know, forming a third party, particularly one that is viable, particularly one that's got a chance of winning elections, never mind presidential elections, just, you know, getting people elected to the House or, you know, maybe even the Senate, the uh, statewide offices, things like that. But, you know, that's really hard. Ask the Libertarians, ask the Greens. It's really, really difficult. And I went through the list of just how many offices were up on the ballot in 2022. Um, and, you know, you just have to find, you know, oodles of, of candidates who will, uh, I, I don't know whether the idea was that, well, they would be Republicans and then Republicans would leave the Republican Party and then join this. Uh, you know, I, I, I used kind of Bull Moose 2.0 is the nickname for it. I didn't really know. It's not really calling what this other thing would just do, a call for American renewal. So let's call it the renewal party, right? You know, were people, were Republicans going to leave the Republican Party and then join the renewal party? Was the plan to go something like New York State, where you're allowed to run on more than one party's label? And so Republicans could run as both the Republican Party and the renewal party? Um, or was there going to be this spontaneous generation of people who had not been in involved in, in politics, but who were suddenly going to say, hey, I want to be a part of this? Look, I think it's safe to say, based on this release of this list of 100 names today, that one, they really are starting from scratch. This really is you know, a bare bones operation. And um, this list of 100 folks includes a bunch of people who I respect a great deal. Uh, off the top of my head, Barbara Comstock, um, Elliot Cohen, John Negroponte. Uh, Hayden has run both the CIA and the NSA. He's no slouch. You don't really think of him in the political context. Uh, Michael Chertoff, who used to run DHS. Mona Charin, who used to be one of my colleagues at, uh, at National Review. Uh, a couple of these other folks. I, I think well of these people. I got to say, Greg, for all of my criticism of President Trump, I, don't, I would not want to line up alongside Max Boot in my criticisms. Um, I don't think Mark Sanford is a name that lots of Republicans are saying. What, what does Mark Sanford think these days? I think Joe Walsh is a clown. And I think Evan McMullen should pay his vendors. <laughs> I think Anthony Scaramucci, uh, look for whatever, you know, I know he's attempted to reinvent himself. And I realize he is not happy with his association with Trump and then completely, and that's fine. You got, you know, you, people are allowed to do that. I don't know if these the, these figures, though, kind of turned into gadflies, kind of saw themselves as people who are doing this for attention, who are not really taken seriously, and do not seem like a shaky foundation if you want to build a conservative third party that will evolve and reform separately from the Republican Party. In fact, one of the weirdest names I saw on this, uh, Greg, Bill Weld. Greg, wasn't Bill Weld running as a libertarian in 2016? He was, but he did run as a challenger to Trump in the primary in 2020. So I guess he was temporarily back and now he's out again. Okay, so just to be clear, the, the Republican Party should change to be more like Bill Weld, because otherwise he will leave again <laughs> and they could suffer the consequences of when he left, which was winning. <laughs> that's that's not really, you know, all that compelling. To, I'm, I'm not feeling all that threatened here. Um, elsewhere on this list, I, I don't know about you, Greg, I was really pleased to learn that Connie Morell is still alive. Uh, Rick Lazio apparently let him out of the witness protection program. <laughs> yes, I saw um, that too. Look, I, I, you know, I cover politics for a living and I'm not as plugged in as I used to be. And because of the pandemic, I'm not out as much. I'm not meeting people. But I, like half these names I did not recognize. Now, maybe that's on me. Maybe I'm not, you know. Two other little uh, wrinkles that kind of jumped out at me from this. Um, I think it was interesting to see the number of names that you'd expect to be on a list like this who were not there, Greg. Um, John Kasich, nowhere to be seen. Uh, maybe I mean, did, did they call CNN? Did they did they check the green room? You know, <laughs> no Bill Crystal, no George Will, someone else I respect a great deal. No Joe Scarborough, uh, Colin Powell. You know, although I guess you could say the last 
Republican Colin Powell supported for president was George W. Bush. Um, I, you know, I don't think anybody from our friends at the dispatch were on this list. I think the only person from the bulwark who's on this list is Mona Charin. Uh, George Conway is on it, but I don't see anybody else from the Lincoln Project. And let's face it, the reputation of the Lincoln Project is not what it once was. Uh, Mike Madrid's still there. What's that? Mike Madrid's on there too. So, Madrid's uh, on there. Okay, because also I saw Mike Murphy, and Mike Murphy is the guy who like wasn't on the Lincoln Project, but I just kind of because he fit that demographic, I just kind of figured <laughs> he was there the whole time. Turns out he wasn't. Mike Murphy said that the Lincoln Project should disband after the last scandal. So you know, um, but just kind of look at this, and I'm like, so what? Kind of what? What makes this different from the Lincoln Project? What's what is this group going to do? And I'll tell you, you know, so far, you know, what's next? It's part of their website. It says, well, they're asking for emails, cell phone numbers, and zip codes. So they want your mailing address. Mm-hmm. They want your email address. And they want you. They're putting together a mailing list and a, and a phone contact list and an email list. They usually use that for, for fundraising and use that for email and for the advertising. I'm not saying this is a grift. I, like I said, I respect a bunch of the people involved in this. I'm sure that a lot of them genuinely believe all the principles they laid out. But I'm, I don't see how you get from this to a functioning third party, even under the most generous set of circumstances. And I'm kind of left wondering what this is, what makes it different from the Lincoln Project? What makes this different from whatever? I, doesn't doesn't John Kasich have some Americans for a Better America type group or something like that? <laughs> Don't half these guys have some sort of, oh, you know, I've actually formed a political action committee and think tank and, you know, like, okay, but what does it do other than ask people for money? Um, by the way, this is a great time to remind people that you should subscribe to NR Plus. Um, it's $6 for 12 months. Anyway, or 12 weeks. Or anyway, um, anyway, so look, we'll see what happens. But I think this is a fairly underwhelming list. And someone reminded me um, that people, I, have to, I can do the good Jeopardy moment. You know, Greg, you're a smart person. You recognize the name Jack Reed, right? I feel like that was a Democrat at one time. Yeah, so he still is a Democrat, and he's still a senator. He's in, from Rhode Island. Oh, that Jack Reed. Yeah, I thought he there's hasn't one died was yet. The, there's one, uh, the but he's been in the Senate too. for about 25 years after serving multiple terms in the House. The Republican he defeated to get elected to the House, who has not held elective office or any senior appointed position since then, is listed on this open letter. Wow. That'll drive in all those Republicans in Rhode Island because that that state's right at the tipping point. I'm not sure which way it's going to go in the next election. And and so, Jim, the thing that uh, sets me off about these people, though, they claim to be the principled conservatives. And I'm not saying this about everyone on this list, but way too many of them. When we got to 2018 and the midterms and all of a sudden they weren't just saying, uh, you know, we need to elect principled conservatives, maybe people who could stand up to Trump if they didn't like Trump. But no, we have to elect Democrats. We got to end the Republican majority. And then in 2020, they even got to the point of like sending out press releases, lauding the choice of Kamala Harris as Joe Biden's running mate. And when you get to that point, I don't care what else you call yourself. You're not a principled conservative. Don't pretend you are. Yeah. Like, again, I, I, I would love to see how these, you know, kind of summarize my position on, on Liz Cheney right now. On the facts, Liz Cheney's right. You know, the 2020 election was fairly fairly and, and legitimately decided. There are no bamboo traces in the ballots in Arizona. There were no Venezuelan hackers. Trump should stop embracing every kooky conspiracy theory that says he won the election and the country should move on from this. You know, that having been said, I'd kind of like to know, you know, there's a, there are a, lot, but there's a bunch of Republicans who believe this. I wish Republicans didn't believe this, but they do. So the question is, all right, what do you want to do about this? Um, what do you want to uh, do? And there are a whole bunch of people who, based on a, on you know polling that might indicate that maybe 50% of Republicans see themselves as being loyal to Republicans and 46% of Republicans see themselves as being loyal to Trump. Some people look at that and say, this is the time to have the fight. Well, look, if 50% of the Republican Party declares war on the other 46% of the Republican Party, maybe the 50% wins but it's going to be a mess. It's going to be bloody. It's going to leave everybody, you know, or everybody damaged. And you look at this right now, not controlling the House, not controlling the Senate, even though the margins are very small. Um, And the Biden running the the executive branch, that that right now, this is not a good time for Republicans to be consumed by infighting. This is the moment to hold the line and kind of say, hey, you know, there's a bunch of issues we can, you know, sort out. You know, look, there are Republicans with very legitimate disputes on trade. There are Republicans with very legitimate disputes about, uh, big tech and whether it's time, whether, you know, they should be treated as uh, a public utility. There are, you know, we can have these debates, 
But the idea that Republicans should turn on other Republicans, basically say, this is the moment, like the, this is the moment for the anti-Trumpers to drive the Trumpers in the party. This is a minority of the party. <laughs> We're trying to push out at least a plurality of the party, if not a majority of the party, right? If you right, also it's like the Trumpers, they, let's say they're they're forty six percent of the party, but they're all very intense about it. They all feel very strongly about it. And if Trump says that's it, we're leaving the party, then you get the Georgia runoffs all over the country. So it's one of those things. Like I like the people who are like, "Yay, Liz Cheney," to acknowledge how they get from this moment to a better and stronger Republican Party. Because I got to tell you, when Nancy Pelosi talks about how proud she is of Liz Cheney. I just think we should, it should enter our minds that just maybe Nancy Pelosi doesn't have the best interests of the Republican Party at, at heart. <laughs> really? Just maybe, right? Uh, all of these folks in the media who are like, oh, wow, I, I love this. There's a CNN commentator who's like, well, I never thought I'd be loving Liz Cheney. Well, look, Liz Cheney is fighting with other Republicans. Democrats love watching that. They're not, they don't really take sides. What they're rooting for is the conflict. They want to see Republicans fighting with other Republicans as much as possible. Look, when Trump runs out and insists that he legitimately won and... Venezuelans are behind it and the Chinese are behind it and this effort we're going to do a recount in Michigan. You know. Okay, I get it. He's ridiculous. Um, I don't think, but, but he's also a guy who thrives on conflict and he's a, thr- a guy who thrives on media attention. So what happens when the other Republicans decide to fight with Donald Trump? Well, it's going to get a lot of media attention and generally Trump's going to thrive on it. You're not going to exhaust Trump, right? Trump may fade away gradually over time. We've already seen a little bit of that in the polling numbers so far. And if you think, oh, there's no way that Donald Trump ever fades away from public attention, I'll remind you, um, back in 2009, if you said who is probably going to be the most important Republican of the decade, there's a really good chance the answer would be Sarah Palin. Didn't shake out that way. People love Sarah Palin. People, people, I think the fan base of Sarah Palin never stopped liking her. They just moved on to other things. She became, you know, chose not to run in 2012. And by 2013, 2014, people were kind of getting tired of her. She wasn't saying the same thing. It's very tough to maintain a fan base for more than a decade in American politics. And Donald Trump entered the stage in uh, mid-2015 as a, as a serious presidential candidate. So I don't know if Donald Trump's, you know, long-term prospects are all that great. But I do know the prospects for the Republican Party right now are terrible if they have an all-out civil war because Liz Cheney's decided, that's it, we're settling it here and now. I believe the phrase you're looking for, Jim, is strange new respect uh, yes, that, that the media go. has. Well, we haven't for- seen that before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had that for uh, John McCain, except for a few months in 2008. And of course, any Republican that uh, that went against Trump, uh, Mitt Romney, Jeff Flake, uh, et al. And whoever advances the narrative uh, for the left uh, will be will be given that title as well. So anyway, uh, we'll be watching to see how this plays out. I think it was uh, well stated by some. Uh, that there could have been a whole lot more attention by the Republicans on other issues uh, this week, like inflation, like gas, like Israel. Uh, And so uh, having a lot of attention because they had the vote when they did, uh, Republicans could have had a unified message on a number of other things. So hopefully that is the case uh, going forward. So, Jim, on that note, have a great day. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus, Radio America. Thanks so much for being with us today. If you don't already, please subscribe to the Three Martini Lunch podcast and tell your friends about us. We're very grateful for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Please keep those coming. They're a huge help to us. You can get us on those home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch podcast. Follow us on Twitter. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. And whether you agree with us or disagree, as we talked about in today's podcast, we're super grateful that you follow and that you listen. Have a great Thursday. And please join us on Friday for the next Three Martini Lunch. Hi, it's Dana Lash, host of The Dana Show. Every day, I'm here to keep you up to speed on the most important stories and info that you need to know in your very busy life. And if you're always on the go and you want to stay connected, just download our daily podcast and take it with you. It's a great way to get up to speed speed on what you need to know and what legacy media may not be telling you. Visit DanaRadio.com and click on the podcast link or subscribe at iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts.